Who? who? Banu, Banu Shankar Rao, you know, from IG. Okay. Yeah. Who is right now in University <laughs> of Hyderabad. Yeah. The quite a number of uh, University of Hyderabad people also will join. I have sent it to both ARCI and University of Hyderabad. Oh, okay. How close are you to University of Hyderabad? So your campus? 45 minutes by road. Oh, oh, I see. So it's not that close. It's not that far. Maybe about 25 kilometers possibly. Hmm. Well, what about the TAFR uh, campus? TAFR is also similar. Maybe an hour. Uh -huh. Hmm. Yeah, one of my postdoc is a scientist in TIFR. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> we are the only one who is slightly away from the city. You see, the oh, University see. of Hyderabad is closer to the city. And even mm -hmm. TIFR is also more or less close to the city. Of course, once upon a time, they were on the outskirts of the city, but the city has grown uh, to an extent that they are all become part of the city. Yes, friends. Uh, are we ready, Mudrika and Kishalai? We can start possibly because he's already 9.30 in the night for him. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want him to uh, become too late for his uh, yeah. sleep. The live stream has also started. Ajayan? Yeah. OK. OK. I'm ready. A very good morning, everyone, on this virtual meeting platform. And those who are listening on YouTube, I can see about 15 people uh, waiting to listen there on this bright Saturday morning in Hyderabad. And a very pleasant good evening to Professor Ajay. Uh, can I request all of you to please mute your mic for the clarity? It is my immense pleasure. I am Mudrika Kandilwal, Associate Professor in the Department of Material Science and Metallurgical Engineering, to welcome you all to the reunited Distinguished Lecture Series by IIT Hyderabad. The Honorable Speaker for this lecture is Professor Ajay, Department of Material Science and Nano Engineering, right in the university course. In particular, this is a special interaction. As you all already know, perhaps, the Professor Ajay has kindly accepted the distinguished professorship at IIT Hyderabad. Before I formally introduce our speaker and pass on the screen to Professor Ajay, I would like to invite our director, Professor B.S. to say a few words about this lecture series. I request you all again to please mute your mics if you're not speaking. Thank you. Over to you, Professor. There is some, there is some echo coming, Mudrika, from yeah, the so, I do not know from where. Anyway, so good morning, everyone, and good evening to Ajayan. And uh, I think the rest of the people are all hopefully from the Indian uh, side. And uh, this is uh, a very, 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 uh, I would say, uh, um, happy occasion that we have a very, very distinguished uh, faculty member, Professor Ajayan, who is well known to most of us and a good friend of. Uh, uh, a large number of Indian scientists, and he keeps on visiting very often to India. Uh, and uh, I have very good association with him from my Madras days. And uh, we are very happy that he has, he has accepted to be a distinguished professor at IIT Hyderabad. And, and we started this lecture series with him as the first speaker. I would like to see uh, as uh, uh, months go, we will have a uh, regular. Uh, lectures of distinguished uh, faculty members and distinguished scientists all over the world uh, taking this uh, podium and then and uh, inspiring our faculty members and students to ensure that people focus on quality research and, and contribute significantly both to the country and globally. I think with that few words, uh, I welcome Ajayan and thanks for joining. I, I know it's a odd time for him, but still, uh, that I think that's the only time we could find something which is convenient for both. But um, I'm sorry for troubling him in the night, but uh, he is very enthusiastically proposed this time uh, himself. So thank you very much again for joining us. Thank you, Professor Murthy. I think there is still hope, um, but I'll continue. I know uh, Professor Ajit didn't make much of introduction, and I can see in the chat box uh, uh, Professor from UK has also joined because everybody is quite keen to hear you. But I cannot pass on this until I do formal introduction. 
so professor jain won his btech degree in biological engineering from banaras hindu uh, i request you to mute so i can hear my own yeah there is some small issue you we are able to see a echo from your side but anyway yeah, go ahead otherwise maybe kishal i can go i think now it is okay i think it was echoing uh, from professor yeah, jain's yeah. side yeah. okay okay uh, so uh, professor jain earned his btech degree in metallurgical engineering from banaras hindu university and phd in material science and engineering from northwestern university usa he spent post doctoral time at nec corporation japan and later as a research scientist at laboratory de physique de solida orsay in france and then as an humboldt fellow at max planck institute for metals germany he joined the metal material science and engineering faculty at rpi as an assistant professor and was the henry balraj uh, chair professor in engineering until he left rpi he joined the mechanical engineering and material science department of rice university as the benjamin m and mary greenwood anderson professor in engineering he is the founding chair of the new department of material science and nano engineering at rice university which is perhaps not so new at this time professor ajayan's research interest includes synthesis and structure property relations of nano structures nano composites material science and application of nano materials energy storage phase stability in nano scale system and some of these we will prob probably see today in his uh, talk he has published over 1100 journal papers with over 1 lakh citations and an h index over 160 which perhaps might have increased just while we are talking right now uh, professor ajayan has uh, received several awards and i can only name a few today spears memorial award by the royal society of chemistry senior humboldt prize mrs medal scientific american 50 recognition rpi senior research award burton award for the microscopy society of america he also received recently 2019 jawaharlal nehru birth centenary medal for international collaboration and public understanding He is an elected fellow for U.S. National Academy of Inventors, Royal Society of Chem uh, uh, Chemistry, AAS Fellow of Mexican Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Sciences India, and several others. He also received the Distinguished Alumni Award from both of his alma mater, uh, Northwestern University and Banaras Hindu University. He has held distinguished. guest professorship at various reputed institutes which include school of uh, material science at university of louis pasteur at strasbourg isis france uh, sinhua university china shandong university china shinshu japan iisc bangalore iit tech uh, iit madras iit kanpur nan uh, ntu singapore and also now distinguished professorship at iit hyderabad He received the doctor uh, doctor honoris causa University Catholic de Louvain. He is on the advisory board, of course, of various reputed journals and companies. And I'll conclude by saying he has been part of two Guinness World of uh, Book of World Records: one for the creation of smallest brush, and other for creating the darkest matter. What a great pleasure to have you here, who has such a wide uh, spectrum of experience. Uh, I sincerely uh, express my heartfelt gratitude and hand over the screen to you, sir. I request all those who are listening on YouTube and on this platform to put the questions in the chat box so that they can be taken up after the talk. It's only availability of the time. Over to you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much for those uh, very kind words. <coughs> Uh, since you mentioned that I might be the reason for the echo, I'm not so sure how this is going to go. I hope uh, no, are, are you we still are able to hear you well. But it's fine yeah. now. Nice. Oh, okay. Okay. It's Great. Uh, initial hiccup. So th thank you again. Uh, you know, I, I have known Professor Murthy for quite a while. Uh, I used to be well. I, I'm still a distinguished professor at uh, IIT Chennai, and uh, whenever <coughs> I used to visit Chennai. we had a great time and uh, i hope that will happen when i come and visit iit hyderabad as well in fact uh, uh, you know the last year has been kind of a wash out for lots of us but it also uh, shows that with all the technology innovations like zoom and webex and all that we are able to still continue what we do <laughs> so uh, well, again um, as mudriga said we have a lot of different areas of research and of course today's uh, the time is limited so i'm just going to focus on 
a particular area which is related to uh, super thin uh, 2D two-dimensional materials which we started uh, almost 10 years ago after the discovery of graphene and related uh, events that followed. <clears throat> of course, uh, many of uh, you might know me from the carbon nanotube times because that was the area that uh, my research started. Uh, we still do some nanotubes, surprisingly, but uh, most of the work has now been uh, transitioned to 2D materials and graphene and so on. <clears throat> So let me share my screen. Uh, I suppose it's pretty straightforward. Uh, let me see. Are you allowed to see? Are you able to see it? Yeah, it's coming up. It's coming up. I think uh, this may be a few. Ah, yeah. Yes. Perfect. OK. You can see it now, right? Yeah, we can see. OK. All right. So. <laughs> um, I come from Rice University. I'm, I'm assuming that most of you have heard of uh, Rice University it's in the middle of Houston, which is the energy capital. Uh, but in addition to the energy efforts, uh, we also. Hello. Go ahead. Yes, sir. We can hear. Yes, professor. You're okay, right? Uh, no, okay. We can hear you. Yeah, so I was just saying that uh, Houston, in addition to all the energy efforts uh, that goes on, there's also a significant amount of healthcare research that goes on. There's a huge uh, consortium of uh, medical <coughs> um, facilities uh, around Houston. In fact, just across the road from Rice, uh, you know, places like MD Anderson, which is the biggest cancer institute in the world. Uh, so we do also have quite a good relationship between many of the biomedical research areas. Uh, in fact, my own group does some work with uh, some of the uh, uh, faculty there. Uh, but today's good talk is essentially going to be focused on the specific type of materials, which uh, for a long time people uh, were fascinated by, uh, including Feynman. You know, he was kind of uh, interested in these materials because these materials are different from bulk three-dimensional uh, structures because of the anisotropic bonding. You know, you have layers where the bonds are very strong and covalent, but these layers are held together by weak van der Waals forces. Uh, and there are many examples of these, uh, both in nature as well as synthetically made uh, material systems. Uh, for example, would be graphite, which is actually mined, um, clays and mica and stuff like that, which uh, exist in nature, but also synthetic materials like boron nitride and so on, uh, which can be made into these layered systems. So even you know, as long as the times of Feynman, he, he was kind of curious to see, because these interlayer forces are weak, uh, could we, in fact, just pick up one of those layers and, and explore the properties? Uh, you know, this question was always around. And uh, of course, it's un not, not until the discovery of graphene that the full potential of this approach was uh, uh, realized. And the story kind of began when the scientist who got the Nobel Prize in physics uh, started to really play around with these single layers that was exfoliated from graphite structure. Now, uh, you know, I, I won't say too much about graphite or graphene in this talk. Uh, I will specifically talk more about certain new um, and uh, emerging type of 2D materials, particularly the dichalcogenide, um, which are very interesting and semiconducting in nature. But before uh, I talk about these materials, uh, I wanted to show this picture, which uh, shows a single unit thick layer of uh, molybdenum sulfide wrapping around a silicon step. Um, so you can see that even putting a layer, which has got this atomically thin uh, thickness and pretty large lateral extension, uh, you know, if you put it on a substrate, you are bound to get simple defects like uh, wrinkles and you know, uh, blisters and bristles. I mean, all kinds of these defects are bound to happen. And the issue really is that, um, um, you know, even these small perturbations in structure can have a significant impact on the electronic properties and ultimately the physical properties of these materials. In fact, we have specifically looked at some of these uh, sharp edges and, uh, you know, these type of uh, highly strained regions like wrinkles. 
And you could clearly see, uh, you know, for example, you can do a scanning tunneling spectroscopy study. You can clearly see that these regions show more metallic nature compared to the pristine semiconductor molybdenum sulfide uh, intrinsic layer. So, you know, th this particular aspect is very much uh, part and parcel to nanotechnology, that there is a strong structure property correlation, but at the same time, it's extremely difficult to really get perfection in the structure itself. Uh, and, you, you know, whether it is 2D materials, whether it is nanoparticles, nanotubes, this kind of plays out in different aspects. You know, in the case of nanotube, it was a chirality. In this case, it is these type of defects on different substrates and the substrate interaction. Uh, so uh, this is something that you have to live with uh, to some extent. Uh, and ultimately, uh, you know, you have to figure out ways of uh, minimizing these effects. Now, the talking points, depending on the time uh, that I can uh, use, of course, as more that is getting pretty late here, uh, I'm, I'm going to touch upon a few things like uh, how do you, you know, create these basic building blocks or the 2D layers. Uh, and more interestingly, when you start to stack them, what kind of uh, changes in behavior you see and how controllably you can stack these structures uh, and in addition to that, I'll also talk a little bit about uh, the potential of creating uh, heterojunctions uh, within a single layer uh, and also some doping and uh, alloying of these materials. And uh, uh, so, again, it, it's about material science in two dimensions. You know, that, that's why the title uh, you know, shows uh, all the different things that we can do with most materials, you know, any new material you get, have, you try to control the structure, you try to chemically modify the surface, uh, modify them, uh, create uh, interconnections, 3D structures. So all, all, all the things that you can do, we can we have tried with uh, these 2D building blocks. So that, that's the story of this talk today. Now, if you look at the range of compositions that... Uh, um, uh, layered structures exist in, it, it's really wide. I mean, in terms of electronic properties, you can go all the way from superconducting to very good insulating material. And you find some compositions that uh, follow this structure. Uh, and each of these materials have their own, uh, you know, character characteristics and subtleties. Um, again, today it's going to be uh, mostly, you know, I'll, I'll mostly talk about a few uh, select systems, which we have played around a little bit more, but um, uh, you know we, we have also looked at many of these systems, many of these compositions, and uh, it's now pretty uh, commonplace that we can make uh, all these materials in a reasonably large area, large quantities. So these are available. <clears throat> now, in terms of creating these uh, super thin layers or 2D materials, there are multiple uh, approaches people have taken. The simplest one, of course, is a is a physical exfoliation, which is essentially a scotch tape peeling method. Right, that's where the graphene work started. Of course, that has got limitations because scalability issues are there. Uh, the uh, related technique that people have used uh, quite a lot, uh, and this allows you to produce uh, layers in bulk quantities, is chemical exfoliation. So you can take a material and uh, you can uh, put it in a solvent uh, with the right kind of surface tension. And you can put, uh, uh, you know, some kind of force using ultrasound or uh, microwave or whatever uh, you, you want to put. Uh, these exfoliate pretty nicely along these, uh, 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 you know, interlayer uh, weak <coughs> forces. So uh, there is many, I mean, uh, a tremendous amount of work that has been done in exfoliating and optimizing the exfoliation technique. Uh, that's an art in itself uh, of, of various layered systems. And this particular image I wanted to show because this is not a traditional layered system. Uh, it's it's a iron ore basically, alpha uh, Fe203. And one thing we showed a few years ago was that even these non-layered, traditionally non-layered structures, you are able to exfoliate along certain crystallographic directions if you have the right kind of energy. And in fact, uh, the, this this article that I quote at the bottom uh, from Nicholas Munet et al. Uh, in Nature Nano kind of gives you a map of pretty much all the possible materials that you can exfoliate and which along which crystallographic planes it will exfoliate with uh, the minimum amount of force. So it, it's really an interesting uh, approach because you can now get very, very thin layers of even 
traditionally non-layered systems. And the point for this particular material is that when you make such thin layers uh, going to less than a nanometer or so, you start to see some new uh, properties emerge. For example, this uh, iron oxide, when they were very thin, we found that they uh, start becoming ferromagnetic. Uh, normally, iron or Fe203 is not uh, ferromagnetic. So th there are some uh, emergent uh, properties that appear when structures become very thin. So that's another reason why one should study uh, these dead materials. And there are very many examples of uh, this exfoliation of variations of the theme. Uh, this is another approach where we were able to pick up very thin layers of gallium uh, using a slightly different approach. We called it a solid melt exfoliation. Because gallium melts at a pretty uh, reasonable Once it is in the molten stage, you can essentially pick up very, very thin layers using some kind of a, a stamping uh, technique. And um, again, we could get uh, uh, layers that are as thin as a nanometer, uh, very nicely crystallized on these different substrates. And of course, gallium is a metal and it still remains a metal when they are uh, thin. Uh, but uh, metallic structures are also important if you want to ultimately build devices because uh, you need to have good contacts and gallium is a pretty good material because it melts and nicely forms a contact. <laughs> uh, there are, you know, before going into multi-component systems, even as, if from a single component point of view, there are many materials that now has been grown in uh, as 2D layered systems. Tellurium, selenium, sulfur, uh, I know, may, many of these structures have already been made into super thin, single, or almost monolayer thickness. And this is a nice review if anyone wants to look at it uh, on elemental 2D materials. It just appeared last year, a couple of years ago, and it was written by a bunch of us, uh, essentially focusing on elemental 2D material. And as you can see, all the way from graphene to silicene to phosphorine, borophene, all, all kinds of materials have been proposed, made, characterized, uh, measured. So the, again, uh, you know, there, there's no dearth for uh, materials that can be made in and, and the structures are different, you know, some of them are flat, some of them are puckered, some of them have uh, modulations, uh, they have faces. So, I mean, it's a whole library of uh, materials and structures that are available, even in the single component. Uh, I, another system that has gotten a lot of popularity is the semiconducting transition metal dichalk materials like molybdenum sulfide and molybdenum selenide. And uh, I think about 75% of the work in 2D materials in the last five to 10 years have been on these TMD systems because they show good semiconducting properties. You know, graphene is a great material, but it, it is still kind of metallic. Uh, it doesn't have a band gap. So uh, one had to look for, um, you know, semiconductors and these are traditional semiconducting materials. Of course, the band gap changes as you go to thinner and thinner uh, layers, and some of them actually transition from an indirect to direct band gap when it comes to mono layer. So there are some, you know, changes when you go to very very thin uh, single layers and so on. But nevertheless, uh, the growth techniques are pretty similar, and uh, you know these transition metal dichalcogenates have really been uh, examples where one could actually make very thin semiconducting. And we were one of the early people who pioneered the chemical vapor deposition growth of uh, TMD systems. And uh, the idea was very simple. Essentially, you uh, deposit seeds of uh, molybdenum oxide, dioxide, and uh, then you chalcogenize them by high temperature. And they seem to kind of grow into these super thin uniform, uh, and you can control between mono layers or uh, you know, layers and so on. It's pretty uh, now well established that you can grow these chalcogenides uh, of various compositions, both uh, uh, by component and tri component systems. Again, uh, this particular <coughs> reference that I listed below, it's, it's from uh, Singapore, uh, showing a huge library of materials you can grow by CBD uh, of these uh, TMD systems. Of course, you know, when you grow these by uh, nucleation and growth process, you are bound to end up with defects. And that is one of the uh, issues 
because consistent results are sometimes hard to come uh, because of the lack of you know single crystal materials or experiments, particularly electronics uh, and electrical transport behavior. Uh, grain boundaries have a significant impact. And grain boundaries are very interesting in these systems uh, because if you think about it, it's a completely flat uh, layer. And if you want to create, uh, you know, uh, an orientation difference, you need to think about uh, topological defects. For example, you know, five-membered rings and seven-membered rings and six-membered lattice. And this is kind of uh, universal whether you uh, look at uh, graphene or whether you look at uh, TMD systems. I'll show you a couple of images. This is actually from. Uh, molybdenum sulfide, and you can see the grain boundaries have these topological defects, which are different from the six member rings that you see in the lattice. And these defects are also very interesting, especially in this two component systems, because then you uh, end up with uh, sometimes sulfur deficiency at the grain boundary, uh, and, and that changes the electronic structure. In fact, people have even measured uh, magnetic properties of these grain boundaries because of the electronic um, structure change at these boundaries. There's also an attempt at the same time to grow really uh, larger single crystal-like domains. Uh, and again, we have been one of the uh, groups that have managed to do this. So today you could actually grow almost a millimeter sized grains without any grain boundary, without uh, these grain boundaries. I mean, uh, defects obviously you cannot avoid. But uh, pretty pretty good crystal, so that you can get consistently good measurements when you are doing. Uh, there is again other defects in these systems, point defects. Um, I don't have time to go into details, but if someone is interested, this is a good reference to go to. Uh, people have documented various types of defects in these systems, particularly the CVD grown ones, where uh, defects are. And, and it's very clear that defects have an impact. Uh, in, in fact, this is not from our group, it is Jim Horn's group from Columbia, clearly showing that uh, if you change the density of defects intentionally, your electronic properties change. The uh, low temperature PL spectrum uh, sharper peak uh, if uh, the material has lower density of defects. So there's certainly a correlation between electronic structure and uh, defect densities. And again, you know, it has not been so easy to control uh, the, the kind of defects that appear uh, because you know, the growth itself is kind of complicated and high temperature. Uh, it's pretty hard to control defects. Um, I, th I think, you know, there is a window in which you could actually work with, but uh, still uh, that would be an area for the future to optimize. And then the, some people have done actually intentionally introducing defects uh, by uh, you know, oxidation or hydrogenation processes. Uh, and these are done essentially to improve chemical reactivity or catalytic reactivity. So uh, we have done some work where uh, exposure to hydrogen creates these specific uh, holes in the structure, exposing more edges, uh, you know, atoms, and that increases the catalytic uh, activity in uh, hydrogen evolution reactions or um, you know similar reactions. So uh, again, these materials like molybdenum sulfide has traditionally been used as a catalyst uh, by not pure molybdenum sulfide, but doped molybdenum sulfides. And here we were trying to understand how, uh, you know, things like dopants and defects change the chemical activity. The other option is to kind of make uh, uh, Know, nanostructures from these 2D layers, uh, and again, lots of work being done in making uh, ribbons or quantum dots of graphene and similar type of 2D structures. And once again, because the large number of edge atoms sitting in these ribbons compared to uh, flat sheets, you have much higher activity in many of the chemical reactions that and so, uh, you know, edge sites are important. Uh, for reactivity in these materials, obviously. There are, I, I'll just show you one example of other materials that also uh, form in these uh, formats, these structures. Molybdenum oxide, particularly the non stoichiometric oxide of molybdenum, molybdenum dioxide, seems to form these very nice uh, flat sheets uh, during uh, CVD process. And these are also interesting because you can control the amount of defects in these molybdenum oxides 
and you start seeing again certain emerging properties like piezoelectricity. Uh, in fact, there is a particular name that uh, uh, you categorize these, and these are electrons, essentially these type of uh, defect-induced <coughs> um, phenomena like piezoelectricity, nanostructures and oxides, and also in 2D molybdenum. Now let me come to something that is a little more exciting in the sense that uh, um, uh, you know the, this is only applicable to these type of 2D uh, materials uh, layers, and that has to do with stacking. Um, obviously, you know monolithic structures of layered materials exist as stacked layers of the same composition, but because you can now extract layers of different compositions, there is a possibility that you can mix and match and put it together as uh, uh, in a shuffled deck of cards, uh, which, which makes it a very interesting approach because you know these materials or these systems have never really existed before. Uh, so that's what I will talk about. And uh, you know people have imagined all kinds of architectures by simply stacking these 2D uh, layers of different compositions and looking at what kind of properties this would have. So, uh, but, but at the same time, when you start to stack these layers uh, of different compositions, then there are multiple uh, challenges. One for, you know, especially if you're focusing on uh, transition metal dichalcobinite. One of the issues is that uh, uh, these type of materials exist as both semiconducting and metallic state. So a layer of molybdenum sulfide, depending on how exactly the, uh, the, the chalcogen atoms are sitting uh, on top of each other in a single unit, you can have either a 2H, uh, which is a semiconductor uh, material, or a 1T prime phase, which is called metallic. You know, slight change in structure, but pretty much the same composition, same lattice parameter. <clears throat> uh, so, first of all, I mean, if you want to control the stacking, you have to control the phase that is formed during growth. So that, that's a challenge. And secondly, when you have a, you know, a layer added on top of another layer, uh, there is another stacking problem now. Uh, you know, again, the uh, stacking between two layers, uh, one can also have different types of stacking. Uh, again, there's uh, two edge stacking and uh, you three know, R stacking. Again, I don't want to go into detail, but just to let you know that these, are, these end up as different uh, stacking sequences. So, but when you are actually putting these things together and building these multi-layer architectures, uh, then uh, depending on how exactly these stacking occurs, you have different uh, properties because electronic interaction between the layers depend on stack. And I will come back to that in a moment, which uh, has led to some very interesting phenomena in recent times. So, again, from our perspective, what we wanted to essentially grow by CVD, you know, because you know, Place is not really a scalable approach. So we wanted to grow these either layer by layer or introduce multiple precursors so that they can actually just grow as multiple stacks. So we have done a lot of work in trying to figure out what kind of structures grow when you have precursors of different. Uh, and, and what happens in general, uh, again, this is kind of intuitive um, in some sense, that when you introduce two different precursors, let us say you have molybdenum sulfide and tungsten sulfide growing at the same time, uh, you could either have one stacked on top of the other, uh, or you could actually have almost a lateral heterojunction because at the end of the day, these kind of materials are isostructural. Their, their lattice parameter is very close. So you could have a um, you know, head-on epitaxy and you could just have continuous growth of two different faces uh, stitched together and and what we realize is that you can play with temperature to increase the yield of one or the other so at higher temperature it looks like there is a strong segregation and these layers seem to stack one on top of the other at lower temperature you start to see a mixed system where there is both in plane and stacked uh, sequences and of course we have to do a lot of microscopy and of course you can also standardize some spectroscopy techniques to understand what kind of stack formed and we realized that uh, under certain conditions you can optimize a preferred 2 edge stacking uh, again you can paper where we have you know published details of how the stacking occurs 
uh, or at lower temperatures, you start to see this atomically sharp uh, lateral heterojunction. So you can see that you know the, the junctions are atomically sharp. And if you look at higher magnification, you can also see that. Uh, but again, the question about stability of some of these interfaces is very interesting. Situ electron microscopy studies to see how atoms diffuse across these two-dimensional interfaces. And obviously, you can see in the image that there is certain um, uh, diffusion of atoms. Now, the other thing that I was just mentioning is this whole idea of uh, twisted layers. So, uh, th there was several studies that uh, explored this twisted bilayer graphenes, and they found that if you have, uh, if you take two layers of graphene and twist them into a certain angle, uh, you can get some kind of electronic interaction leading to superconductivity. So, these twisted bilayers were seen to be a potential superconductivity uh, candidate. And after that, you know, people were fascinated by this whole idea that you could uh, take any two layers and put them into various mores uh, by twisting and uh, get different properties. And the whole field is now called twistronics. And there's large funding uh, you know, provided for creating these uh, more uh, uh, you know, layered structures. And uh, again, these are very difficult to characterize sometimes because first of all, you need to have single crystal layers to understand how exactly these things go. And secondly, uh, you know, the techniques that are used are mostly transport. So the actual structure property correlation is kind of difficult to come by. Uh, we have done some recently, some low energy yield spectroscopy studies to understand how the electronic structure changes with twist angle. Uh, but it seems to be a realistic, uh, um, phenomena that appears in these kind of monolayer systems when you put them together and start to twist. There's also another possibility, which is uh, uh, in general called the Janus structures. So uh, typically, as I said before, the, the molybdenum sulfide or tungsten sulfide, these uh, dichalcogenides are in fact a three-layer unit where the metal atom is sitting in the middle, uh, metal layer, and then sulfur and sulfur on the top. But it's very easy to replace, for example, uh, sulfur with selenium or another chalcogen or tellurium on one side. So you can get these completely Janus type of structures where one side is selenium, one side is sulfur or vice versa. So people have, again, played around with this unique uh, system where uh, the, the single unit itself is kind of um, you know, anisotropic because of the, uh, the kind of chalcogen sitting on either side. So, um, again, you're already seeing a very, very different ways of uh, uh, playing around with these uh, systems and doing material science and looking at properties and so on. Uh, as a metallurgist, I mean, uh, originally, uh, you know, uh, my expertise was metals and metal faces and face uh, diagrams and face stability was very important. And, uh, you know, even in these systems, although not much has been done, uh, there is a potential of uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, the stability of faces. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, both examples are kind of very different uh, from each other because one of them uh, relates to strong segregation of uh, domains and faces, and the other one uh, where a potential uh, mixing is pretty readily. Uh, so the first case where there is a strong segregation the uh, the system that we chose was this boron nitrogen carbon and again this is a very fascinating phase diagram in my mind and we have been looking at this for almost uh, two decades now uh, and there are many phases in this phase diagram that are important and the, the really interesting thing is that uh, almost all these phases exist as both cubic and hexagonal uh, uh, structures so for example if you take carbon you know you have graphene or graphite and diamond you have you take boron nitride, you have cubic boron nitride and hexagonal boron nitride. And you take uh, carbon nitrides, there are hexagonal carbon nitrides and cubic carbon nitrides. So, and also three component systems like BCN, BC2N, uh, and other systems like BC3, they all have cubic and hexagonal analogs. <laughs> so, it's really a, a really fascinating uh, phase diagram. And many of these thermodynamically stable phases that have been predicted 
uh, theoretically have not been experimentally uh, made. For example, uh, you know, a, a single crystal of BCN is still missing from the picture. Right? <clears throat> but anyway, what, what we were interested uh, if, in the context of these graphene-like material was to be able to grow these three component layers where you have boron, carbon, and nitrogen all uh, in, in, a, in a single uh, graphene-like layer. And when we did those experiments where we introduced the precursors for both these uh, uh, domains, uh, what we ended up was not a uniform distribution of BCN, but a completely segregated domain structure of BN and CC uh, bonds appearing uh, with various dimensionalities depending on the conditions of growth. So you end up with, you know, scenario, uh, the picture on the right, essentially uh, like, like a quilt-like structure where these domains are made of either boronitride or carbon, and there was not much. And again, people have looked at uh, how exactly this transition occurs from carbon to B and C and then to BN. And uh, many experiments have shown how uh, this happened. Uh, and the thing is that if you look at HBN and graphene, you know, hexagonal boron nitride and graphene, they are entirely uh, isostructural. They're same, same lattice parameter, same structure. poles apart, right? Graphene is a metal and HBN has got a 6 EV band gap, which is a really uh, good insulator. So uh, these structures that, uh, that that I showed you where these domains of BN and graphene are stitched together, they form this very heterogeneous electronic material because one of them, you know, these domains are uh, insulating electronically and the other domains are very, very conducting in the plane. So uh, this leads to some fascinating uh, architectures uh, and electronic, uh, you know, uh, uh, again, we, we can go pretty nicely crystalline uh, films of these. But what I was basically saying is that using some tricks, one could uh, coax them into forming these well-defined domains or geometries within uh, there. Uh, and there is a protocol to do this. I don't know if I to go into details, but at uh, end of the day, you can make these engineered structures in two dimension where the isostructural domains of boron nitride and graphene are well designed and uh, created. <coughs> uh, and, and you can think about interesting devices. For example, you could put uh, a graphene domain, uh, you know, like, like that image in the middle right, uh, within a hexagonal boron nitride lattice, and that becomes a really a nice antenna. You know, it's it's a two D antenna basically. Right? So, and if you have also a semiconducting, uh, you know, uh, domain, for example, a BCN type of structure, then you could have metallic insulating and semiconducting domains all in the single atomically thin layer, and you can start to think about fully functional devices based on these in all two dimensions. So this is really a, a beautiful example of how nano engineering can be done within two dimension, and we have made uh, many different patterns and uh, engineered uh, two dimensional architectures using this approach of uh, stitching together domains of isostructural. A very different type of uh, system is a uh, is a composition a molybdenum ditelluride. And here, uh, a similar kind of uh, 2D engineered structures could be made, but with the same composition. Uh, when I say same composition, uh, the, the, the way you can make these metallic and semiconducting junctions are by choosing the phase that you use. So molybdenum telluride exists as 2H and 1T prime phase, just like I mentioned before. And if you can coax them into these patterns that I showed you for BCN structure, you could create some very interesting metal semiconductor junctions within a uh, uh, single unit thickness. Uh, so uh, just to go back a little bit, if I try to grow molybdenum telluride under normal conditions without really controlling uh, you know, what phase is formed, you get a distribution of both the phases. So if you look at the image on the left, you can see that there is a 2H MOT2 and 1T prime T2 uh, formed on the same film, if you actually just grow them. And the reason why this was interesting 
is that people wanted to explore the semiconducting properties and a device based on the 2H MOTE2, but with uh, 1T prime uh, MOT, uh, MOT2 as a contact region. Like uh, phase, you get a better ohmic contact. So, uh, I mean, people did make some devices, but essentially it was just growing randomly and going and finding regions where the uh, T2 formed a metallic phase and then putting uh, your contact there. But we wanted to do this in a more systematic way so that you can precisely define where the metallic phase is formed. One of the ways of doing this is actually to go and uh, change the 2H phase into a 1P prime phase by laser radiation or some strain engineering or intercalation. There are lots of ways people have uh, shown this and published in very big journals. <clears throat> but even all, all these are essentially time consuming and not very uh, you know, scalable. So uh, what we decided to do was to see if you could actually do this during growth itself. And one thing we realized is that um, if I take molly telluride and start to dope it with uh, tungsten, uh, you start to see only the metallic phase. So the doped, tungsten doped molly telluride uh, essentially falls into the one phase for tungsten telluride system. So uh, that kind of brought us to this idea that um, you could essentially, uh, if you can controllably dope only certain regions of the MOT2 that is being grown, those regions will become metallic. So what we did was we essentially patterned tungsten underneath uh, the growing, growing layer and then did the growth. So the tungsten diffused into the molly telluride during growth and essentially formed these one thing. Is, and you can see one, we can actually grow large area periodic uh, 1T prime 2H uh, uh, you know structures in a periodic fashion. So that, that you know these are the kind of engineering nano engineering things that we do so that you can make um, uh, scalable devices and you know, scalable structures. And again, uh, I don't have time to go into these, but uh, even the junctions between these metallic and semiconducting bases show some very unique emerging properties like piezoelectricity. And uh, it's amplified at these junctions for some kind of uh, reason. Uh, again, time to do that. Here. The final uh, piece that I will mention, maybe in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, is related to uh, doping uh, and alloying and creating multi component uh, D layers from, you know, starting with. And unlike the carbon uh, boron nitrogen system where things get very segregated, it, we saw that when you start to put some dopants particularly uh, similar elements like uh, selenium into molybdenum sulfide or tellurium into molybdenum sulfide or tungsten into molybdenum sulfide. They seem to distribute pretty well, at least at low dilutions and low concentrations. And we were able to see that they're pretty much uh, distributed. A lot of electron microscopy and analysis and so on to see how they distribute. And it looks like they are uniformly distributed. And we were able to show that uh, by changing the concentration of dope you could change the band gap by several hundred MeVs, which is a pretty good, uh, um, you know, result. You can change the band gap reasonably uh, by doping. Uh, but then, obviously, when you go to the three-component system, uh, you know, more towards the alloy at higher concentration of dopants, then you still have this problem whether, uh, you know, at, at what conditions would these be completely mixed or miscible and at what conditions would they separate, right? It's just almost like looking at the phase diagram of a 2D material. Which is, again, the same story with nanoparticles. You know, the phase diagrams kind of shift quite significantly, phase boundaries shift. <clears throat> so, uh, again, there are multiple possibilities. You can have a fully random uh, situation, random, or we can... And uh, again, we also did some calculations, calculations that showed that uh, as I increase the number of components, I have also the leverage to increase the band gap. So going from a single component to a quaternary system, you have a much better leverage to change the band So finally, again, without going into details, 
Uh, I want to say that uh, we were able to create some beautiful alloys of 2D sheets. Uh, this is an example where you have four components, molybdenum, tungsten, sulfur, selenium, and it's a complete uh, map, uh, elemental uh, map, and energy filtered <coughs> image from a STEM microscope showing that um, uh, the positions of all the atoms distinguish between sulfur, selenium columns, uh, and uh, even sulfur on selenium or selenium on sulfur. Uh, again, a lot of image simulations and so on that goes into this. But the bottom line is that we are able to now create uh, nice alloy sheets of these 2D structures, and we are looking at uh, various properties that uh, uh, these have. Um, there's also, again, I, I repeat this many times, uh, you know, uh, the phase stability of these. For example, we have seen that in certain systems, you increase the temperature, it can go from a completely mixed state to a segregated state. And again, this is known for So the, the 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 final um, I mean point is that uh, you know we could make many of these systems a lot of people can uh, but to really you know understand how exactly uh, you know the stability works you need to do a lot more work and a lot more understanding of uh, these two D materials so. I think uh, I better stop here. I've already talked quite a bit. Uh, I, I, there were a few more things that I wanted to say about uh, chemical modifications, you know, changing the dimensionality. For example, you can take these 2D layers and make them into dots and so on. Uh, we can also change uh, the chemical nature of the substrate uh, of the surface. Finally, we could also take these materials and cross-link uh, uh, at the edges and make three-dimensional structures. Uh, so again, you know, a lot, lot of material science we can do with, with these 2D building blocks. And uh, I think there's a huge body of work that is being done around the world on these materials. Um, Application-wise, uh, many of these things are being considered for electronic device uh, applications. You know, still challenging because uh, you need to still grow them on appropriate substrate and, you know, the contacts becomes problematic and architectures are, again, complex in today's electronic platform. So, I mean, I'm not saying that this is going to happen overnight, but there is, you know, some of these materials have shown potential uh, for the next generation of semiconducting channel uh, material. And uh, there is a lot of work being done for energy storage. You know, some of these materials are being used there. Uh, composites, uh, that, that, that's another area that uh, uh, people have been looking at. I mean, traditionally, these kind of materials, molybdenum sulfide, uh, are, have been used as lubricants or catalysis in catalysis. So th those are also being explored. So again, uh, you know, broadly speaking, yeah, it has been kind of fun to look at these very specific class of materials, the layered materials, because they have this um, unique nature which allows you to exploit the single layer systems. And um, I think again, at, at least in the US, there is still a strong uh, set of activity in this direction. You know, new new things emerge like the Twistronics that I mentioned to you. <clears throat> so uh, that, that's pretty much, um, uh, you know, what I have to say. And, and intercalation is another option that you can do. Let me finish here by saying that, um, you know, what we do is kind of creative stuff. We play around and we all try to optimize and then look at the properties. Now, ultimately, the question is, by doing certain things, can you create some kind of emerging new behavior? You know, electronic interaction between layers, how, how, how does that work? Ultimately, when it ends up as applications, you need to know exactly how you design these things. And that's where, uh, also, that's where material scientists come into picture. You know, I think many of the things that we do in the lab um, doesn't really get into the, you know, uh, the lab, uh, the, 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 the fab, <laughs> because uh, I think that they need, the requirements are quite different. <clears throat> and, you know, we need to have good material, single crystals, <clears throat> grown on the right substrates, grown at the right temperature. So there is a lot more to be done in, in these areas, in these emerging nanomaterials areas. 
So that's where I, I will stop. Um, and of course, we do a lot of collaborative work. We work with people who are experts in, for example, devices. Uh, and that's the only way we can uh, actually prove the point in many cases. And I have, you know, I'm also glad to say that uh, we have a lot of collaborations with Indian institutions and hopefully uh, soon we'll have something with IIT Hyderabad. And, uh, visit and Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ajay. Wonderful. Very, very exciting. And yeah, I'm thank you very much. You Thanks. Today. Thank you. Uh, thank I you have so a few much questions. I'll come a little later. I think can start. Yeah. yeah. Sir, if it is okay with you, can we take a few questions? Sure, oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. So there are a couple of questions in the chat box from Surya. Um, magnetism that you are talking about uh, is because of defects. So is, if it is so, is there a proportionality between defects and magnetism? And his follow-up question is, does BCS theory explain superconductivity in these 2D materials? You're probably asking the wrong person because uh, I, I'm certainly not an expert in magnetism or superconductivity. I mean, all I was saying is that these grain boundaries, because of defects, they do show some uh, ferromagnetic behavior. Um, I, I don't know these questions, obviously. Uh, you know, I can refer you to somebody else, but uh, I shouldn't be answering. Sure. Uh, another uh, question and a request from uh, Arvind is that you have mentioned about the biomedical work that your group does with uh, in collaboration with MD Anderson. Could you please mm -hmm. throw some light on the type of nanomaterials that you envision as promising entities for cancer nanomedicine? And also, if we could arrange for a particular talk, nanomaterials, biomedical, next time. That's a request. Sure. I, I think it's, uh, I mean, it's obviously an important field. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we have engaged with the medical community in different projects. I, I don't have time to so talk about everything, but for example, imaging is one aspect, uh, right? I mean, nanoparticles and nanomaterials are used for uh, imaging. And if, you, if they are rightly uh, functionalized so that you can target to the right cells, uh, then that, that, that's really an exciting area. And we have uh, quite a number of faculty, again at IIT yeah. Hyderabad who are into this imaging in medical field. So I think yeah. So I, I'll be glad to talk to them when I'm there, or even connect them to some of sure. our colleagues. We'll connect, at, I'll uh, connect them uh, to you. We also have a few medical here. doctors who are faculty here. Okay, so that's right, another right. interesting. I, mean, I, I really think that this uh, materials bio interface is really uh, unexplored area to a large extent. You know, every time I talk to my friends and uh, the medical center, we come up with a new idea. You know, and there are so many interesting problems. Uh, these are complex problems. So, uh, I mean, these, some of the things that we think first are kind of naive, but at the same time, they also appreciate the fact that there could be some solutions from nanomaterial side. And I think it's a great, great field to be in. Uh, perhaps the best field I can think of at the moment, uh, you know, for scientists who are coming up. Mudrika, Mudrika herself uh, does a lot of such work. And Arvind, who is yeah. sitting here, is a medical doctor, okay, who is with us as a faculty. And they are. Yeah, I mean, continue brainstorming, you know, continue brainstorming and uh, discussing various aspects. Again, you know, material cannot solve all the problems. Uh, but, uh, I think the main problem that I, I realize is that we don't understand some of those problems. Right? Many I mean, it's the same story when you start working with industry, right? I mean, you really don't know what the problems are. Many times academics are living in their own world. And that's I mean, you know, creating knowledge base. But it's only when you actually see a real problem, then you can provide a real solution, right? <laughs> That, that, that's, so, so that, that's my we have started, we have a new program now, Ajayan, where the students spend about four months in the hospital, okay, yeah. and then and then identify problems and then work on them so that you come up with a prototype at the end, okay. Yeah. So that, that I mean, med med medicine, medicine. medicine is being revolutionized by technology, right? I mean, for example, things like CRISPR is going to kind of completely change a lot of things that we cannot imagine. So I, I think, you know, Bo both are necessary, the sure. technology that we build and the problems and the understanding at the medical level that uh, the doctors have. I, I think the combination of those two really would make a wonderful 
opportunities. <coughs> Yes, one more question from in the chat box by Chandrasekhar. Uh, mm -hmm. 2D materials are showing promise with large spin orbit coupling for spintronics. Can you please put your thoughts on how to tune uh, spin orbit coupling? So I think there has been quite a bit of work on this 2D magnetic materials uh, like the chromium iodides and things like that. Um, I think the problem so far has been stability. Uh, and again, you know, one could imagine systems that would have, again, with the help of theorists, uh, you know, we, we could do dope systems, magnetic uh, impurities and so on. Uh, but ultimately, if you really want to make it a practical uh, application, uh, then one has to go beyond just the concept, right? I think it has to be stable, it has to be consistently, uh, systematically made. Uh, so, I mean, I mean, again, my suggestion would be to work with uh, you know, theorists and experimentalists to understand and design some of these new uh, materials. Thank you, sir. Maybe a final question. I have one or two questions, if you allow me, Mudrika. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. So, see, as a metallurgist, I'm curious about this alloying business. Okay. Yeah. So, so, if I look at the systems that you have currently worked on, they're basically pseudo binary. Okay, so you have a molybdenum, yeah. uh, let's say telluride, where you have doped yeah. molybdenum with tungsten, and in the tellurium side, maybe selenium and things like that. So, yeah. what happens yeah. if you go beyond this stoichiometry? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a very, very, very interesting question. We have tried some, uh, you know, uh, non chalcogens, uh, you know, to, to alloy. And most of them actually force this system to segregate. That, that's what we have seen. Again, okay. uh, to understand the full extent of the phase diagram, you need much more studies. Uh, yeah. It's unlike uh, uh, metallic alloys. I think these all, uh, uh, you know, uh, the structure is dependent on the stoichiometry. Once you grow, go beyond the stoichiometry, the structure possibly is no yeah. more stable. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I was, for example, very interested in looking at uh, a large number of components, like a high entropy yeah. system. Yeah. Yeah. I think we, we talked about this in Chennai, right? Yeah. In, in fact, I'm yeah. also more interested, what happens if you can uh, think of tuning the system to make it amorphous 2D layer? Uh, we, again, something will, that... Will, uh, will it have any exciting property or at all? Or well, well, absolutely, I, I, you lose I, all the properties. Yeah, the fundamental question is is a 2d glass stable right I yeah mean, 2D, I, that's the question um, right so I, I don't example, know in a high entropy alloy this is possible typically we have made a phi component alloy which is completely amorphous okay you choose the elements in such a way their atomic radii are slightly you know different in such a way yeah. that they have nothing to do with a deep eutectic typically most of the glasses are related to deep eutectics you are aware of that so you have yeah. an alloy which is uh, which has nothing to do with uh, you know uh, liquid getting stabilized. They are like a true amorphous entropy stabilized amorphous material. Okay. Right. So so it it will be interesting to create a layered system that is high entropy. Yes. Right. Uh, I don't and know. Then we'll have to see whether it will still remain a, a, a crystalline or would it become an amorphous? And if so, uh, whether it is an equilibrium crystalline structure. Or it will go to a metastable crystalline structure, or not? So what kind of a thing? Yeah. That is. No, uh, these are really fascinating uh, structures. Yes. I, I mean, think you should think of. Okay. That's it. That's that is from my side. Any, any okay, questions? we'll talk more. Uh, sure, yeah. definitely, definitely. Uh, more, yeah. more uh, small questions. Yeah, Banu Banu Garu is asking a small question. Uh, Professor Ajay, I have a yeah. small question. Do you have any? Magic angle to create a moire lattice in the molybdenum tungsten sulfur and selenium system. What you are presenting? Uh, yes, it, I mean again, I don't remember exactly what these angles are, but but this is being published well, and you know we, we know what the angles are that would give you um, properties uh, from the insulation to superconductivity. They will be changing. The angles are yeah, I, I'm not sure if people were able to show superconductivity in the TMD systems. I think uh, the superconductivity was mainly seen in graphene. Mm -hmm. And that's probably because of the strong correlation that you can find. Um, uh, that's what I'm I, I don't know. I mean, again, uh, you know, there, there's, I could refer you to some publication where the actual angles are uh, known. Okay, that is fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Oh, all right. Very, very good. So I think it was a good discussion and hopefully I'll see you guys soon sure. in, in the end of the year. Well, I hope now more, more faculty from our side will start interacting with you. Maybe some collaborations start getting established even much before yeah. you arrive here. So we are expecting right. you somewhere in January or so. Spend some time, one or two weeks at least. Yeah, I, I mean, both ways, right? I mean, if uh, somebody is coming to the U.S., a student yeah, yeah, that's, for short yeah, We'll see. Hopefully in a few months, uh, the travel will yeah. start. Hopefully, uh, the COVID will be, uh, we will be right. out of COVID. Let's hope that. Okay. Yeah. So, All right. Uh, good to... night from Houston and uh, see you then. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, a lot, Professor. Ajay. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all everyone who was here who participated in the discussion and everybody on the YouTube. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good night to Ajay. Bye. Good night. Thank you, Kishalai. Thank you, Mudrika. Thank you so much, sir.